My name is Susan Deutsch. I'm the program manager at the News Writer Center and welcome to this book launch. Before we get started, I just want to tell you a little bit about the Muse. So we are a creative writing nonprofit in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, we're kind of the heart of the literary community here in Hampton Roads. That's our goal is to create a writing community and we offer classes and seminars and workshops for all ages, all skill levels and all genres. And tuition assistance is available for all of those because we don't want anything standing in the way of someone who wants to learn how to write, how to express themselves, someone who wants to hone their craft. And we also offer hundreds of free literary events each year, just like this one. Um, and so we're just really happy to have everybody here. So this is a really exciting moment. This is a book launch for The Tender Grave by Sherry Reynolds, who's here with us today. So Sherry grew up in a large extended family in rural South Carolina. She graduated from Davison College in 1989 and VCU in 1992. She teaches creative writing and literature at Old Dominion University right here in Norfolk, Virginia, where she serves as the Ruth and Perry Morgan Chair of Southern Literature and is currently Department Chair of English. She is also taught at Virginia Commonwealth University, the College of William and Mary, and Davidson College. And a little bit about the book. This is one of seven novels Sherry has written. Others include Bitterroot Landing, The Rapture of Canaan, which was actually an Oprah Book Club selection and a New York Times bestseller, uh, A Gracious Plenty, Firefly Cloak, The Sweet In Between, The Homespun Wisdom of Myrtle T. Crib, and the play Orabelle's Wheelbarrow. And this, The Tender Grave, is her first release in some time. So we're really excited about it. Uh, and I'll let Sherry, tell you more herself. Over to you, Sherry. Hey, everybody. It's, um, it's exciting to be here. I thank you for joining me. Um, I can see that I have my family here and my childhood friends, and I can see that I have um, my Davidson friends and my college friends and I have um, my grad school friends from Richmond. I have my Sophia sisters with me today. I have my students, some of them, and some of my old teachers and current colleagues. And I am so thankful and honored that you're here with me. Some of my longtime writing friends are here too. And so I didn't know that I would ever publish another novel, honestly. I kind of thought I might have been done. I was done for a while, but here's The Tender Grave. I hope you can see that. I can't see what you're seeing. So anyway, that's probably good. So I won't worry about how I'm looking or this glare on my glasses too much. I'm gonna read to you for, it's gonna be about 30 minutes of reading, but I'm doing short sections. I'll intersperse um, some talking in between, and then we'll have some time for Q and A. So we are in the middle of storms here. I'm on the Eastern shore of Virginia. We've got big storms, but they have quieted. I think that's probably cause my mama's praying cause she can, she can work it. Um, but, but we could have a little tornado issue or something like that. I know that some of you over in Norfolk are having that too. I hear that they're a little better in South Carolina right now. Anyway, I'm going to get started. I'm going to read um, just from the beginning of the book, if anybody has a book and wants to, to follow along, and then, um, and then we'll talk. So this is the tender grave, the opening. Dory was still a little high. Her blood vessels pulsed all through her scalp, like she was a cartoon character and someone was sketching her a wig that very minute, bearing down with a marker and drawing every strand of fake hair on her oversized fake head. She felt cartoonish and her timid cartoon blood crept fretful through her blood vessels. Why was her blood so bashful and why did it move so slowly? She pictured her blood cells like little hunchbacks all in a line, a chain gang of hunchback blood cells in a comic book of their own, staggering along one frame at a time, going nowhere. She scratched at her scalp and was surprised to find that her hair was still wet from the shower. She didn't feel quite real. As the lights of the bus station came into view, bright in that hour before morning, yet somehow still dingy looking, her mom veered to the side of the road and pumped at the old Buick's brakes. The brakes didn't half work anymore. The tires were worse, already bald, and it had started to drizzle, so the tires had more than the usual trouble catching. It made her sick 
how they jerked and then jerked and then slid to a stop, still a full block from the depot in that rural rundown North Carolina town. Her mom clicked on the car's interior light and dug through her pocketbook, finding at last the envelope with rent scribbled in tiny tight letters right where the stamp should go. Dory watched her count out what money she had, not enough for rent anyway, turning all the crumple bills in the same direction and straightening, straightening them out before handing them to Dory. She'd use that envelope again. All right, darling, her mom said, time to go. Dory unclipped her seatbelt and tucked the money into the pocket of her jeans, but as she reached to open the door, her mom said, hang on. From the glove compartment beneath the owner's manual, her mom produced a second envelope, this one her tire fund. She licked her finger and counted through another small stack of tens and fives. What will you do, Dory asked. Her mom slammed shut the glove box, shook her head and shrugged. She pulled out a cigarette, lit it and took a deep drag. I'll make do, she said holding the smoke a long time before she exhaled. I've got no choice. The thick smoke lingered between them. Dory tried to hold her breath. The chain gang of blood cells stomped their little boots inside her newly drawn head. I'm sorry, mom, she replied. Try not to drive on the highway, okay? A deacon at their church, who was also a mechanic, had told them they shouldn't go over 30 on those tires. Just get out, said her mom, but Dory couldn't, not yet. Her mom sighed, took off her glasses, and wiped her eyes with the heels of her hands. Dory could see fingerprints smudging the lenses of her glasses, and so she lifted them from her mom's thigh and cleaned them on her t-shirt before giving them back. Thank you, sugar, said her mom. She took Dory's hand and squeezed it, then kissed her first knuckle and her second and said a prayer that God would watch over her and keep her safe. Now please, just go. The sun wasn't up yet, but the milkiness of the coming day pushed through the dark. Dory didn't look back. She was still a little drunk and took care not to stumble as she crossed the potholed parking lot, reciting to herself, don't step on the crackle, you'll break your mama's back. She tried not to cry when she heard those threadbare tires squeal off. Most of the seats on the bus were already taken. Dory pushed her way along the narrow corridor, her overstuffed backpack grazing the shoulders of passengers along the aisle. She tripped over a sneaker nudged into the walkway, but caught herself before she fell. Halfway back, she found a spot next to a skinny brown-skinned granny and dropped into it as the bus began to roll. She had the worst headache of her life. So she closed her eyes and tried to ignore the heavy thumps escaping a stranger's earphones. She hadn't been to bed not all night, and though she'd brushed her teeth before she left, her mouth already tasted stale. She suspected it might taste that way forever, whether she brushed or gargled again or not. Her new reality, her life, the flavor of bile. She wished that she were dead and that her boyfriend Kane was dead and that the world as she knew it had scorched to ashes. She wished she'd never been born. In her mind, she went round and round, like her mom's old patched tires with no treads left, no way to get a grip on anything. It made her hate her mom that she drove around on old bald tires. Then it made her cry that she might never see her mom again. Round and round, a circle of hating and sorrow. At a later stop, when her seatmate got off, she threw herself against the window, pushed her pack into the neighboring space and tried to sleep in spite of a crying baby and the dings and sizzles of a video game on somebody's phone. But images from the night before kept intruding, the spray of blood across her favorite coral cami, the blood splats on her canvas flats, her mom still in her nightgown, shoving Dory fully clothed into the shower and scrubbing her down, saying, oh my Lord, my dear Lord Jesus, then stripping her and scrubbing soap into the stains on her clothes, bits of grass and clumps of dirt swirling around the palest pink water at their feet. The images interwove with the screeches of the bus's brakes, the one-sided phone call of somebody desperate to make it to New York before his brother died, the driver's announcements of this station or that one, the rustle of passengers coming and going. Dory woke with a glaze of diesel exhaust clinging to her skin, an oily coating across her nose and forehead. Someone had stolen her backpack by then. At least she'd had the good sense to keep her wallet in her pocket, a back pocket that buttoned, and her mom's cash buried deep in front. She still had money, but no spare clothes, no phone. She knew better than to use the phone, of course, but it had all her pictures on it. So she'd turned it off, wrapped it in a t-shirt, and stashed it at the bottom of her pack, 
Now her pictures were gone too. She had no food or water and no toothpaste or deodorant, which she needed. A ripe fear pulled in the pits of her arms. She couldn't escape her own stink. The bus driver was no help. The passengers around her had seen nothing. She wasn't sure where she'd been when, they'd closed, when she'd closed her eyes or how many bus stops they'd passed. The driver suggested she file a police report in Richmond, but she couldn't do that. She couldn't talk to the police when she was probably wanted by the police or would be soon. At the terminal in Richmond, she got off anyway with plans to board a different bus, one headed for the Virginia coast and toward the older half-sister she'd never met. Maybe her sister would welcome her if she was lucky. She bought a bagel from a vending machine, but even with the cream cheese, it was too tough to eat. It reminded her of taking communion, how sometimes the host would just swell inside your mouth, huge and unchewable, and wasn't that fitting to be so full of the body of Christ that you couldn't even swallow. When the next bus came, she threw away the bagel and boarded. She told herself not to be afraid. Plenty of times she pictured running away, taking her backpack and heading cross country. This wasn't so different, just another kind of adventure. But for a while, she was glad to be anonymous and traveling light. But fear kept surging up, sour in her mouth and in her guts. She tried to pray, but why would God listen? She was a troublemaker. She knew about the wages of sin. It wasn't long before her imagination hijacked that bus and drove it directly toward hell, that charred and fiery chasm she'd heard so much about. She tried to focus on the pine trees, green and supple, passing by the dirty bus window, but hell kept coming back, how her skin would crisp and blacken and flake away. She could hear her dad's voice preaching and crying and beseeching God to save them all from eternal damnation, but Dory knew her soul was unredeemable. She would writhe in the flames for all eternity. She had earned it. Okay, I am going to move ahead just a little bit, but I'm going to turn off my email, which I didn't know I'd left on, so you won't have to hear it beep. Um, let's see, I think I got it. So I'm going to skip ahead to when Dory arrives at the small bayside town where her sister lives. And this town looks a lot like the town I live in, which is Cape Charles, Virginia, but I have taken many fictional liberties with it, so I don't use the actual town name. She made it. She settled on a rock jetty that separated the public beach from what was left of a fallen in dock. The dock itself had washed away and all that remained were the pilings, weather-worn, leaning, jutting up from the sandy bay floor and marking off the tide. Some of the pilings were 20 feet tall, others had worn to nubs. They looked like the ribs of some decomposing sea beast. Turns and pelicans kept vigil from the irregular tops of posts. The place was eerie and peaceful at once, but it wasn't entirely private. For company, Dory had a chatty little boy playing in the algae along the shoreline. It's just like salad, said the boy, salad for stingrays and sharks. He picked up a, a leaf of the slimy looking sea lettuce, shook away clumps of sand and brine and stuffed it in his mouth. Yuck, said Dory. She'd never been to that beach before, had never seen that kid before, had never tasted seaweed in her life and didn't want to, but she was hungry. Except for some cheese puffs, she hadn't eaten since the too tough bagel the day before. The boy spit and giggled. It's gritty, but it don't taste that bad. Be better with ketchup, though. You want some? No, thanks, she said. She wished he'd scat. That's what her mom used to say when she wanted a long time. Scat. But this kid was going nowhere. The air was thick and muggy, and the gray sky faded into water the color of knives. In the distance, church bells rang three times and played a hymn she recognized, though she couldn't remember the words. The boy said, you're not supposed to be down here. This is the working beach. The tourist beach is down yonder. He pointed south where a few beach chairs and umbrellas randomly freckled the sand. This ain't where you go to get a suntan, I'll tell you that. Dory shrugged. What are you doing here then? I ain't no tourist, said the kid. I'm waiting for my daddy. He motioned to a man in waders walking out among gray pilings, a five gallon bucket in one hand, a crab line in the other. Dory wished she was on vacation. I'm not a tourist either, she replied. That seemed to satisfy the boy. He was maybe seven, wormy looking, brown from the sun. He wore only a pair of cut off shorts and scratched at bug bites all over his arms and back and belly, his legs and even his head. Red welts peeked from beneath his crew cut, some of them scabby. 
The boy found a stick and dragged it along the shoreline, holding it up to impress her with the seaweed and lettuce he'd harvested. That's nasty, Dory called back. Is not, he said. I'll show you how to make tater chips. He rinsed some of the lettuce in the clearer water just beyond the gunk that had settled over the rocky place where Bay met sand. Then he climbed up on the jetty next to her. Once you clean it, you just tear it in pieces and stretch it out on the rocks like this. Carefully, he draped each bright green leaf on the sunny granite. You wait for it to dry out good and crunchy, he explained. Then you got tater chips. From out in the water, the boy's father hollered, Hey, Randy, quit bothering that gal and bring me the net. I ain't bothering nobody, the kid yelled back, but he scrabbled down the rocks and waited out. While he was gone, Dory climbed down too and paced that empty strip of beach, finding oyster shells and pieces of broken bottles littering the edges, bits of rock and dried out legs of dead crabs in the sunshine. The pilings were shorter closer to shore. You could peek right down into the hollowed out centers of some of them and find cracked shells or stuffed down candy bar wrappers. Dory rolled up her jeans and splashed her way just far enough to stand among those pilings with their seagulls perched atop. It was such a quiet place, softly lapping water, occasional squawks of laughing gulls, a good place to clear her head and work up her nerve before she went searching for the older half-sister she'd never met. She would need to look cute even though she couldn't possibly be cute, given all she'd been through the past couple of days. She'd need to be charming. She could still be charming, or at least she could try. She examined the posts and found tiny black snails and hairy looking grasses growing against the wet wood. She found barnacles and algae and in the distance she saw the boy's father thigh deep and pulling in one crab after the next, surprising them as they feasted on what grew along those posts. In a while, the boy ran back to find her. Hey, he called, what's your name? She wondered if she should make up a name, but in the end she told the truth. You wanna be my girlfriend, he asked. I'm too old for you, she said and laughed. She was 17, but could pass for 20. Besides, I got a boyfriend already. Just thinking of him made her choke. The boy shrugged and said, that's okay, I'll show you my hideaway anyhow. He led her up the bank to a hot place where the high tide couldn't reach, talking all the while. Dory was glad to be distracted. They stepped over rocks and broken bit at bricks, then to hot sand popped with holes from ghost crabs shying from the sun. Creeper vines and grasses mask a place where trees had tipped over, leaving wiggly roots partially exposed and partially embedded in the ground. Trees with scoliosis, their lowest branches grew against the sand. The boy pushed back some vines to reveal a shady, shallow cave beneath one tree's contorted branches. Come on in, he said. He had a little braided rug in there and some plastic army men he kept inside a cookie tin. He crouched on the rug and Dory sat beside him and he introduced her to his army. The vines and leaves against her neck kept making her think there were spiders on her. Again and again, she slapped at nothing. You come here every day, she asked. Just Sunday, said the boy. My granny's sick, so we bring groceries every Sunday. Then me and daddy come down here and crab while mama visits and rolls her hair. Oh, she said. Mama fixes chicken and puts it in mason jars so Granny can eat it all week long. She don't eat that much, though. Dory's belly grumbled. Sounds like you could eat a whole jar full of chicken, said the boy. Does your Granny live here, too? No, said the girl. She didn't mention her older half-sister. She hoped her sister hadn't moved. She had a name and an address memorized long ago from an envelope with a postmark so faded you could hardly read it. As soon as she worked up her courage, she planned to scope things out. I'll show you where my granny lives, the boy offered. It ain't far. So she followed Randy out of the cave and he led her down to the water, then around some rocks on the far side of the pilings and back to sand again. From there, he pointed out a small bungalow that sat alone about a quarter mile inland, huddled between squatty fat trees at the far edge of town. That's my granny's house, he said. She lived there by herself, Dory asked? Yep, said the boy. Maybe you should move her to the nursing home so she can hang out with other old people. She's too old and set in her way, said the boy. She don't even go to church no more. Only place she goes is therapy to get her broke shoulder worked on every Tuesday morning at 11. You ever been to therapy? No, she said. It feels good, he said. Some Tuesdays I sneak on the table next to my granny and let the therapist stretch all my muscles. The boy's father called to him again. Randy, get over here. You better go, said Dory. He sounds mad. But Randy didn't hurry. He just shrugged and made little squiggles in the sand with his toes. If you be my girlfriend, he said, I'll tell you a secret. 
You're a mess, said Dory. I already told you I got a boyfriend. You wouldn't want me to two-time him, would you? Well, yeah, said Randy. It's a really good secret. Okay, she said, just tell me. Randy grinned. Back before I was born, he said, when I was still in my mama's belly, I had a pair of magic flip-flops, but they fell off when I was coming out. Oh, yeah, said Dory. They're probably still in my mama's belly somewhere. Dory laughed and said, you think? If I had them flip-flops, I could jump from here to that pier, way down yonder. He pointed to a place so far down the beach that you could barely make out the people fishing. Just leap right up and land way over there. I need me some shoes like that, said Dory. I can still remember them, Randy told her, from when I was a tiny baby, not even yet born. So Dory is, so, so I'm taking a break now to tell you a little bit. I'm going to jump ahead. That's what I'm going to read you from the Dory section. Um, Dory is one of the main characters. The other main character is her sister, Teresa. And I'm going to read a section of Teresa's in just a minute. But before I do, I want to tell you something about Randy. Um, Randy has three sections in this book. He's at the very beginning. He's at the very end. And he's right in the middle. And um, what, part of what Randy represents really is innocence and magic. And um, Dory has committed a terrible crime, by the way. She's running from having committed a hate crime against a gay boy in her school. And Randy is actually her teacher. And he is um, just a really special little figure in the book. He's been my teacher too. And so I wanted you to have a little sense of his voice in case you need him to be yours. Um, I'm gonna jump on up now to Teresa. So this is Dory's sister that she's never met before. They haven't met yet. And I'm going to pick right up and go um, with the very opening Teresa section. Teresa paused at the end of the pier, took her phone from her pocket and scrolled through her playlists, looking for music to pump her up, something peppy enough to transform her leisurely morning beach walk into a full blown exercise routine. But she hit a button by mistake, and instead of Lady Gaga, out came the voice of sperm donor 8466, their runner-up. Apparently, the last time she synced her phone, she transferred the donor interviews along with her new music. Donor 8466 was an entrepreneur, an easygoing laughing guy, and a winemaker with plans to one day purchase his own vineyard. Both she and Jen had liked him a lot, much better than the donor who came in third, a doctor with a scratchy voice who couldn't even think of a favored childhood memory to share. They downloaded audio interviews for their top three baby daddy contenders, but even though the doctor was the closest physical match to Jen, they'd eliminated him right away once they heard him speak. In the end, they'd chosen donor 9721, a lawyer, and they'd gone through six rounds of insemination at the fertility clinic across the bay, paying extra for their lawyer's graduate degrees, but they still weren't pregnant. Teresa stopped along the shoreline to flip over a horseshoe crab. Mating season was complicated business for them too. On June nights, when the tide was high and the moon was full or new, the horseshoe crabs crawled out of the bay and onto the beach to breed, large females tailed by smaller males. Inevitably, some of the males got stranded on their return trip, flipped onto their backs by competitors or the tide, and left exposed and desperate as the sun came up. Teresa tickled the legs of the crab to make sure it was still alive. When it kicked back, she lifted the edges of its shell, carried it to the water, and watched it slowly drag itself out into the bay. Listening to the entrepreneur's interview felt a little like cheating, given that they'd already committed to the lawyer, so she scanned her phone and found his interview. As she made her way down the beach, flipping one horseshoe crab after the next, she noticed something troubling about the lawyer's voice. He was a whiner. Everything he said came out as a low-grade complaint. Why hadn't they detected that before? He liked law, but really he wanted to be a writer. He'd done some writing, but just textbooks for law students. No wonder they hadn't gotten pregnant. Even his sperm was ambivalent. Jen had been a big fan of the lawyer from the start. She hadn't finished college and was impressed by his credentials. More than that, she liked him because he was a reader and subscribed to the symphony. She wanted a kid who'd be artistic and soulful and smart. But if they were trying to match the donor with Jen, 
The entrepreneur was obviously the better choice. He raced go-karts as a kid. He was brave and playful. Why'd he come in second? They should have gone with the entrepreneur. He'd never worn braces or glasses, had no known allergies. His only injury, a broken arm from when he flipped off his trampoline, the little daredevil. Daredevil sperm were sure to be more potent than the sperm of any poor complaining sad sack attorney. Some of the horseshoe crabs Teresa found along the shoreline were already dead. Those she left on their backs for the seagulls to pet clean, but she was able to rescue seven or eight, give them another chance, another day to spray their seed. It seemed like sperm was all she could think of. That month, for the first time, she and Jen planned to inseminate at home, both to cut down on the expense and on their stress. Their friend Eric, who had secretly agreed to serve as a sperm donor, had been on call for the past week, but though Teresa was due to ovulate, Though she had dutifully peed on sticks each morning to check her hormone levels, she hadn't yet made that single line transform into a double. It was becoming embarrassing how little power she had to pass a simple pee test. She hoped that exercising would help her stop obsessing about it, but even when she went for power walks, she found herself distracted by thoughts of sperm donors. If Eric's goods did the trick, they might not even need to order more vials from the cryobank at nearly a thousand dollars a pop. But if she didn't conceive this go around, she'd insist on the entrepreneurial sperm. They could place their order in plenty of time for next month's ovulation. So there are three big conflicts that are running through this book. And the first one is the crime. So um, the crime that Dory has committed and that she's running away from. The second major thread for the book is the gay lesbian issue. The fact that um, that Dory has committed a crime against a gay boy and her sister is a lesbian. And so, um, so this is bound to create the kind of tension you need to move a novel front to back, um, or I hope so anyway. Um, and Dory arrives in the book and in Teresa's life at probably the very most critical time she could um, when they're going through these inseminations. And then the final major important um, conflict and thread in the book is sisters and sisterhood, um, also um, uh, fidelity and um, what is it that we owe our families? What is it that we owe our kin? And so, um, so these are the, the pieces that push the book, the book forward. I'm gonna read you one more section, one last section. And this section is gonna take place on the very first night after Dory and Teresa meet, okay? Um, so it hasn't gone well at all. Um, when Dory finds out that Teresa is a lesbian, she is sulky and defended and well, she's actually scared, scared to death. And that comes off as just kind of a generalized assholery. She's difficult. And Teresa and Jen, they are um, in the process of renovating a motel and they're living in the part that's the office. And so their guest room is actually room two. And Dory thinks this is just ridiculous and she makes fun of their house. Um, so, so far, almost everything has gone wrong. They've gone to the, um, they've gone to the pub, they've gone out to dinner in this section. And at this point that I'm gonna pick up and read, the last section I'm gonna read, um, Dory has just let Teresa and Jen know that, that her mom has been in and out of psychiatric facilities and that she has just gotten out of foster care not long ago. So that's all you need to know um, to, to understand what's happening in the last section and then we will have some time um, to talk. Okay, so in all the years that she had been out of touch with her mother, Teresa had not let herself think about things like psychiatric hospitals or foster care. From her earliest memories, her parents fought, usually because of her mom's antics. Like the time she took Teresa to sit on the roof during a thunderstorm, rain pelting down, smoky clouds shrouding the sky until lightning flashed through. Teresa and her mom had clapped and cheered for every lightning strike until her dad got home and found them there. Get in this house, he demanded, but her mom refused. Finally, he climbed to the roof himself took Teresa beneath his arm and guided her down the slippery ladder and back inside. Until she was older, she didn't understand that all mothers didn't throw oranges from the fruit bowl when they got frustrated or rush out of the house sobbing and disappear into the woods for hours at a time. And other mothers certainly didn't get hurt as often. The hospital emergency room formed the backdrop for so many of Teresa's earliest recollections as her mom was prone to stepping on nails or tripping over extension cords and splitting open her head. 
Danger seemed to lurk everywhere she went. It took a while for Teresa to notice that most of her mom's accidents happened whenever she or her dad had other things planned. When she was in the finals for the regional spelling bee, her mom had a, an attack of pancreatitis and both parents missed hearing her spell malevolent and schism, though she got kicked out anyway on parliament. What did it mean that she could still remember, still held on to those words? And then when she was in 11th grade, her mom had run off with the Baptist preacher, a married man no less, leaving Teresa and her father to face that blistering scandal. The next year, a letter arrived, her mom's loopy cursive flowering across the pages. The letter proclaimed how good God had been, how she was living with her sisters and brothers in Christ on a farm where they grew their own food and celebrated every sunrise and sunset. She invited Teresa to visit and even joined them there, but her father was sick with emphysema by then. It took him nearly three years to choke to death. Her mom didn't show up for his funeral or help Teresa resolve any of the family affairs. She dropped out of college that semester, but went back the next. Some semesters she could only take a couple of classes. Some semesters she took six at once. When she graduated with a degree in secondary education, she sent an announcement to her mom's last known address. Her mom wrote back from a different location. She was traveling around the South by then, spreading the good news of Christ's impending return. She congratulated Teresa and even sent a gift, a book of devotions for her desk drawer at school. She'd put sticky notes between the pages to share favorite passages. Teresa found a job teaching history two states away and moved from her hometown and all those complicated losses, but she did her best to keep in touch. She even tried to visit once after her mom called from a payphone crying. Teresa got a last minute substitute to fill in at school and drove 200 miles to a diner where they arranged to meet, but her mom stood her up. Later, in a letter, she said it was just bad timing and that she'd finally gotten off those terrible pills as if Teresa had known she was on pills, and now her psychiatric medications could finally do their work. Sometimes there would be months of silence. Then just when Teresa would think she must have died, she'd receive a note. And that one time, the birth announcement for Dorothy Ann, no letter attached, only a rural route box number for a return address. It blew her mind that her unstable mother would bring another child into the world. Her mom was over 40 by then. Teresa herself was old enough to be a mother, but she had better sense. She bought the baby a sweater and mailed it, hoping it would be big enough, and that was the last thing she sent until she invited her mom to their commitment ceremony and reception. It was a risky thing to do. Teresa often wondered if her mom suspected she was gay. She'd been a tomboy, more interested in playing in the creek than playing dress up, but that was no good indicator, and her mom had run off with the preacher long before Teresa began to date. Even after she started seeing women, there was no occasion to come out to her mom. And anyway, she didn't need another reason to be rejected. Then Jen came along. With Jen, she fell in love and all the cliches about love seemed true. She was over the moon, brought to her knees. Silly as it seemed, she wanted her mom to share her happiness. As unlikely as it seemed, she wanted her blessing. At the very least, she decided she should give her mom a chance to know and love Jen. What did she have to lose? She anguished over the mother she... She anguished over the letter she included in the envelope with the invitation to their commitment ceremony. She could still remember how her belly cramped as she waited in line at the post office to be sure she'd included enough postage, but all that anxiety was wasted. There was never a reply. She can't help it, Jen tried to console. If she's as evangelical as you claim, she probably can't say anything without condemning your lifestyle. You know the old saying, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all and her mom didn't. Over the years, Teresa's hurt and anger dissolved into numbness, and when same-sex marriage became legal in Virginia and she and Jen tied the knot again, it didn't even occur to her to share the news. In fact, her mother's absence became no more noticeable than a pepper shaker missing from the table. Most of the time, it made no difference, though every now and then, a little more spice would have improved on an already fine recipe. By the time Dory arrived at her door, Teresa had seriously believed she was over her mother. But there, in the pub with Jen and Dory, she could hardly swallow her fish and chips for the guilt. Maybe there'd been a reply lost in the mail, or maybe her mom never received her letter and invitation. She might have moved to a different address by then. Why hadn't Teresa given her the benefit of the doubt? 
And how could she ever expect to be a good mother if she hadn't even been a good daughter and sister? She'd given in way too easy. With the internet, she could have found her mom. If they'd been in touch, she and Jen could have provided a home for Dory. No wonder Teresa hadn't been able to get pregnant. She had to work a lot harder to connect. When I was little, Teresa told Dory, I used to beg mom to play with me. We lived way out in the country where there were no other kids, so I didn't have anybody to play with, but the only game she'd play was orphanage. That's weird, Dory said. We'd line up my paper dolls in a row and she'd dream up these awful stories about their dead daddies. She'd have them clawed to death by bears or blown up with dynamite. Dory laughed. Sounds just like her. Or she'd make up stories about their mothers who burned up in house fires or drove off cliffs, sometimes killing the children riding along in the car. She'd hold up a paper doll with bent arms or a loose neck and say, this one here's the only one who survived and she will never be normal again. Jen put her hand on Teresa's thigh and squeezed. Yikes, she said. Not very nurturing, was she? She's still not, Dory chimed in. I wanted to play school, Teresa continued. Big surprise there. I even agreed to let the paper dolls have a mean teacher who paddled them for not knowing their state capitals. As long as at the end of the day, all the kids could go home and eat fried chicken and macaroni. But mom would say, gruel, they're starving to death with nothing to eat but gruel. Dory laughed again, her face softening. I can totally see that, she said. One time, Teresa said, I found my favorite paper doll dangling from the leaves of the dragon tree we kept in the living room. She had a yarn noose around her neck and her head flopped over. She looked so pitiful, wearing nothing but her drawn-on underpants. I called mom and she came and sat with me there on the living room floor, and we cried together as we watched her blowing in the wind from the heater vent. Mom said, poor little thing. They hung her for treason. Teresa hadn't known that word yet, treason. She'd had to look it up. They agreed that night that Dory could stay for a few days. Dory reassured them that she'd leave whenever they wanted. She wasn't intending to take advantage. She just needed a place to get her head straight and figure out what to do next. But in the next breath, she hardened her jaw and swore she'd never go back home, no matter what. Teresa had been around too many passive-aggressive types not to understand the manipulation, but Jen didn't grow up like that. Jen was wide open and sometimes downright gullible. She even offered to take Dory with her on the boat the next morning. As they dropped her off at room two, Teresa asked, do you have everything you need? Dory nodded. Okay then, Teresa said, we'll see you in the morning. But Jen wasn't as eager to be rid of her. Are you sure you're okay staying in here by yourself? She asked, because we can put a blow up mattress in the living room if you'd be more comfortable. She looked at Teresa for approval, but Teresa just said, honey, she's practically an adult. Besides that, she hardly knows us. I'm sure she'd, pre she'd prefer a room of her own. I'm cool, Dory said. She tucked her hair behind her ear and added, thanks for everything. She didn't hug them goodnight, but her disposition had definitely improved. As they went into the apartment, Jen said, she brings out your mean streak, T. I know it, Teresa replied. It had been an otherworldly day, and long after Jen fell asleep, Teresa replayed the scenes. Dory strutting down the street, hip bones first, making exercise shorts look seductive. And after she found out Teresa was gay, Dory refusing to meet her eyes, refusing to give her her eyes. It felt punishing, withholding, like Dory was channeling their mom. Why was Dory there and what did she really want? It had taken years, but Teresa had finally succeeded in walling off her mom. Then along came Dory, blowing up everything. Suddenly, Teresa could hear her mom's voice again, that southern drawl she hadn't heard in so long. Her mom had a sweet, placating tone that sometimes didn't match the terrible things she said. Teresa, she called her with a long E. Teresa. It was a beautiful sound, but a dangerous sound. Teresa let herself remember the song of the sound as she tried to quiet her mind and cross into dreams. In that half-sleep, she replayed images of her favorite paper doll dangling from the dragon tree. They hung her for treason, her mom had said, and Teresa heard her own name. Except for that N on the end, it could have been her name. It hadn't seemed right or possible that a person or a paper doll could be punished, even put to death, just for being herself. But that's how it happens sometimes. And Dory, was she more like their mom? Would she slip the noose around Teresa's neck and then cry to see her suffer? Or was she more like the doll, lynched, the ultimate victim, head pinched off from her heart? 
Back on the day of that paper doll execution, Teresa had snipped the yarn from around the girl's limp neck, placed her gently on the floor, and covered her broken body with a Kleenex. We'll need to have a funeral, she'd announced somberly. I'll make the coffin myself, her mom had volunteered. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here with me. We've still got a hundred people. I didn't run them off. So I am so, so grateful. You'll see in the chat now that, um, that we have the names of independent bookstores um, that have ordered the book. In our, you know, uh, to my great surprise and good fortune, the book sold out before it even came out. Um, thank you to those of you who bought one in advance, but this means that there's been a little delay um, in getting them in some of these bookstores, but they will have books. So that's Peach Street Books in Cape Charles, Prince Books in Norfolk, Reed Books in Virginia Beach, Chop Suey in Richmond, Main Street Books in Davidson, and I appreciate every um, independent bookstore and every library that picks up the book. So, okay, I'm going to be quiet for a minute. I'm going to let Susan come in and maybe lead us through some questions that maybe have popped up in the Q&A or in the chat. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Sherry. That was absolutely amazing to hear you read that. Um, yeah, check out those links in the chat for those uh, bookstores. Hopefully they'll have them back in stock soon. And I see some of y'all have already discovered it. If you're in the live Zoom meeting, look down at the bottom in the Q&A section and you can type your question there and we'll get to it. Uh, if you're watching live on Facebook, you can leave a comment there and we'll try to get to it if we have the time. But first, I'd like to start us off. I'm just curious, Sherry, about where, where did the Tinder Grave come from? What was kind of the genesis of this book? Because you have these three themes that you were talking about. And I would maybe venture to say that it sounds like motherhood is another one of those in addition to sisterhood. So did you kind of start with those ideas and did the characters come from there? Or how did, how did that kind of come to life? I'm gonna answer that, but first I just have to tell you how I'm just so touched to see you all. I could just cry with thankfulness to see you here. And I see your comments and I know I've already asked Susan to make sure I get a list of, of who's attended. So I will know that you're here even though I can't actually see your faces. Um, so this is kind of a crazy story. Um, the truest, well, there are so many, there are so many pieces of the tender grave that have little bits of me in it but none of the actual story has me in it. But here's where the tender grave really initiated or, or gen it was the genesis. So maybe 10 or 12 years ago when my grandmama was still alive, my beloved grandma Mary, um, somebody actually kicked in her door and stole her medications. And um, we couldn't believe it that somebody would break into the door, into her house. She had gone to the chiropractor and they broke into her house and stole her medicine. And um, you'll remember that Randy showed um, Dory where the granny's house was. And one of the very next scenes that's going to happen in the book is that Dory, who is very desperate, very desperate, has nowhere to sleep, um, can't find her sister at first. Um, she ends up kicking in that door. And so... Um, so the thing that, um, that, that, that's, that story about what happened to my grandma was a really important story because it was so horrifying to us. Grandmama was the queen of our world and we didn't want her to ever be afraid. And very much like Randy's granny, um, she was just like not interested in getting an alarm system. She was much more, um, more, much more uh, I guess, generous than I could be. And she was saying things like, it's probably just some sweet old poor drug addict, right? Like she saw the kindness in the, or the potential for kindness in this person. And the reason was that they didn't ransack her house. They just went right in and they stole the drugs. And then, you know, she was on, Lord, she was on a lot. But anyway, um, she had a lot of nerve pills in there and they kept getting stolen. Um, and so anyway, that moment, I knew pretty quickly that that moment was going to be something that I would be dealing with for a long time because it brought out, it brought out the vindictiveness in me. Like I wanted to be more like grandmama who would be able to just say, I'm letting that go. Right. But instead, like I wanted to kill them. And in fact, I would say, I, I didn't know this when I was writing it, but I would say that that fury in me, I use in Dory at the time, because later on in the book, you would hear the story of the hate crime, right? Of what happened um, when, when she um, hurt 
this person terribly. And, um, and I wanted to explore rage, I guess, in, in some ways. The other thing about this that's kind of wild is, of course, that's not the center of the book. It's just something that happens in the book. It doesn't even happen at the very beginning. It's probably, I don't know, it's probably in the first 30, 40 pages, I guess, that she's that she kicks in the granny's door. But um, what happens is I end up working both backwards and forwards from that, right? Because um, the question, the, the, the first answer like as a fiction writer, when I have something like that and I'm fictionalizing it, I think, well, who's the first person you would expect to kick in an old lady's door and steal her meds? And then, and you go to that and you make them a bad person, right? You make them a heartless, thoughtless, unredeemable person. I'm not interested in unredeemable. I am interested in forgiveness and I'm interested in how we get there, right? So a better story is to make that a character who is sorry later and who is in fact potentially forgivable so it that that piece even though it's not at the center of the book it pushed me into the backstory when i created dory as the very unusual 17 year old girl who kicks in the door to steal they all think it's a man they're looking for a man all through this book as the person who's kicked in miss betty's door um and and it's a 17 year old girl and then it also compels the book forward so that there's the long answer sorry go ahead Susan what else is coming in hey we're here for your long answers that's really interesting that it, it's this moment that was so powerful for you and that isn't necessarily I mean I've I read that scene in the book and I thought it was really interesting but I, it wasn't central to me it was kind of a scene that told me more about Dory as a character and I guess came back later a little bit but I didn't read it and think ah this right here is what this yeah, book is this about. So it's really about, interesting yeah. that you started from there. Yeah, and so I guess this kind of goes along with a question from Denise, who says, first of all, congrats on the book. She wants to know, do you always know your ending before you put pen to paper or does the ending change sometimes during that writing process? I bet you that's my cousin, Denise. So thank you for coming, Denise. Um, I never know my ending. I, I don't. Well, I'm trying to think if I ever did know my ending. I don't think I've ever known an ending. Um, what I know, I guess, um, I, I something starts me and then I follow. And every choice that I make as I follow um, what has been, um, what, what I can't help writing, eliminates all these other things. So I guess I would kind of describe it like if I knew that I was going to drive to California I would end up in California probably, but there are so many routes that I could take to get there, but I'm heading in a direction. So what I know, what I knew in, in this book is I knew I wanted, um, it's a hard book. It's a fierce book. Um, I, you have to hang with it. Um, but I, and I hope that there's a payoff for it, but it feels like a very important book because it feels that way to me. And if I did my job, then then it really is a book about um, how do we um, how do we deal with being wronged without being victims? How do we um, forgive ourselves? How do we move past our own um, flaws? And how do we um, how do we find a way to um, to redemption? And so I knew that I was headed for a place in the end that was. A better place for both Dory and Teresa. Those are two pieces that I knew, but I did not know, and I don't usually know what the endings are. I also don't often know what the beginnings are. Beginnings, I quite often end up writing after I've got a draft of the book, and this one is no 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 different. Um, you know, I brought the mother became a much fuller character during different versions of the book, and then I needed her at the beginning. I wanted her at the beginning, and I wanted her sweetness to start. Right, I wanted sweetness in her because you're going to hear some hard things about her. We've already heard some hard things about her, right? So I needed that to offset and make the reader stay with her and not, I mean, to, to, to see the complication without judging her too hard so I can get them to the end. Right, and you also have such a sweet, tender moment in the very beginning where Dory takes her mother's glasses because she notices that they're dirty and cleans them and hands them back to her. And I just love that moment because like you said, you can feel there's so much rage in Dory, especially at the beginning. So I love that you have this little moment between these two characters who aren't always, like you said, they're not always easy to like. They're, 
they're kind of, they can be difficult at times. And I mean that in the best of ways, but it's wonderful having that little moment right from the get go. Um, let's see, all right, we've got a question from Nancy who wants to hear your thoughts on the title, The Tender Grave. Uh, Nancy says, after reading the book, it brought to my mind the saying, dig your own grave. Can the choices we make that harm ourselves as well as others be our own tender grave? Can we find forgiveness for ourselves when we turn on ourselves with self-criticism and self-hate and then when we project those feelings onto others? It's a great question, Nancy. Oh, and it's so beautifully worded. Thank you, Nancy, for being here and for that awesome, awesome question. Um, the title was a late title. Um, my partner, Barbara, actually ended up coming up with the title when we knew we needed a better title. I had been calling the book The Cordial Grave all the way through writing it. And that's based on an Emily Dickinson poem. And it's so short, I'll say it for you. It goes like this. Back from the cordial grave, I drag thee. He shall not take thy hand, nor put his spacious arm around thee that none can understand. And I loved the, um, I loved the concept of a cordial grave anyway. And then I loved a speaker that knew more than God and that was going to drag back. And I, um, and, and so that was compelling me as I wrote the book, but, um, but it's not as e it, it, tone wise didn't quite work with what I wanted. And I did in fact want that tender piece that's so often next to the harshness, right? There's a place at the end of the book where I hope I pull this together more overtly. And I don't think it'll spoil the book for me to tell you that, I know it won't spoil the book for me to tell you this, but the image is um, honeysuckle is so tender, right? And so, we, and so sweet and um, a, a delicacy and a beauty, but it'll kill a tree if you just let it go. And if it takes over the whole canopy, and there's, I use that image that something so sweet and something so tender can be murderous even, right? Even without meaning to. So I was playing with that, but I love all those associations that, that, that Nancy brings in and also some of her thoughts about, um, you know, how we can find our own um, tenderness, I hope. Wow, that's beautiful. I love that image of honeysuckle. That's also something that strikes me as very Southern as someone who grew up kind of in this area in the South and then moved away that. for a while. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Nailed it. All right. Um, let's see if we have a little more time. Y'all, if you have more questions, go ahead and leave them here. And I'm also keeping an eye on the Facebook. I see one here from my cousin have. Debbie that says, why did you write another book when you thought you were done? You know, I guess I wasn't done writing. I was done publishing or that was my thing. I just, I have a, I, I'm a, believe it or not, I'm, a, I'm an introvert. I have a hard time putting myself in the world sometimes. And I was not sure I had anything else that needed to be said or that, that I needed to say, which doesn't mean I don't have anything to say. It's just, does anybody need to hear it? And um, it turns out, I guess I think I do. So I did it again. Um, I had also taken, I've been in an administrative position at my job for um, five years now. And um, I have, I, I'm coming to see that I guess I, I've needed this um, to grow into my next self um, and, and to learn some of the things that maybe I need for um for the next stage in my life but i just would have been really so so busy because the work has been so demanding and has taken kind of everything that i had so this is a book that i started at, well i probably started it right after grandma's door got kicked in in some form i think i started writing around that i had a full draft maybe in 2015 or 16, I think. And then I just sort of, I took this job, I set the book aside. And over this time, I, I had these feelings that I didn't know that I needed to do any more publishing or certainly not for the, at the time. I guess I didn't at that time. Um, and then I, um, and, and then I was, I got an email from my friend Faye Jacobs at Bywater Books. And she said, hey, you got anything sitting around that we could look at? And I thought, well, you know, actually I kind of do. And so I sent it off. Um, I've been, I have been fortunate in so many ways um, in my writing life. And I've been able to, to get my works published a lot of the time. But I had not been, um, when I was 
publishing with with New York, big, the the big New York presses. I was not feeling like I was um always I don't know. There there have been good experiences and sometimes I felt kind of lost and unmoored in that. And one of the things that I love about Bywater is that it's small and f such a family and that they've been um able to the, it's it's been a very different experience and that's one of the things that's made it possible for me to publish is to think I like going with an independent publisher and I like working with people that I end up knowing and so that's been a good piece. Mm -hmm. That was wonderful. We've had a few questions about how you choose the names of pairs of books. I don't really have a good answer for that. Um, that that's really not real important to me. But sometimes, like with Teresa's name, you stumble on something that um, that you, you can start playing with treason. And Teresa, you know, that <laughs> didn't, I didn't know that I was, I didn't do it for that reason. It just kind of happened. Um, there are names that, that are, um, you know, that just, that, that pop into my head. And, um, and I just kind of, I kind of roll with it. I try to use a variety of names so that there aren't too many names with the same number of syllables in the same scene. Um, you know, at this point, I've published a bunch of books now. And so I, I try not to repeat characters. I could, I, I may have already done that in terms of names, reusing names, especially with minor ones. Um, but I don't have a, a very interesting answer for that. Thank you. All right, let's see. We only have time for maybe one or two more questions. And there's actually one over here in the chat from Jimmy. So how do you create your characters so fully? Do you create them and then put them in these situations? So I guess we touched on this a little before, but yeah, I guess I guess do they do they spring fully formed from your head as though you're Zeus or do they kind of keep growing and do they take you by surprise? Do you do you draw from people you know in real life? Well, so so sometimes I do. Jenny Painter is one of my old students and she is in Guatemala now. So that is a real sweet thing to see her here. Thank you for coming, Jenny. Um, most of my characters do not come out fully formed. Um, most of my characters um, are, you know, I, I'll have some piece that I'm playing with, that I'm working with. And then I will, um, and I will learn about the character by backing up, by figuring out, well, how did they get in this situation? Who is this and why? The, um, the, the, the example that comes to my mind isn't even from this book. It's from my novel, um, oh gosh, I forgot that name, The Rapture of Canaan. And it was, um, I had, um, I had a baby. I had a dream. That's how that book started is I had a dream of a baby with his hands seen together. And I said, well, who would that book be? Um, you know, who, who would the, who would find that interesting or meaningful that his hands were seen together? Well, obviously a religious group would find that interesting. And then I said, well, who would be the natural mother for that child? And I'm like, well, it would be like a Virgin Mary. And then I think, oh, no, no, no. Let's really mess that up. Let's make it a teenage kid who's pregnant with her cousin and, um, and think she might be having a new Messiah. And I get that little piece. And then I start looking at her and thinking, well, golly, how would she be? How did she get there? Right. And so then I just sort of start, um, um, letting those characters I'm thinking about you know how when you get candy cotton cotton candy and it just you get a little bit on there and it just spins and spins and spins and becomes bigger, and bigger. Yep. so that's kind of how characters come for me but usually I've only got a little bit of cotton candy on there for a while I have to get through the whole thing and then I put it away for a while and then I come back and I see richness um in this book that I've Th this particular book, um, Dory's character was the trickiest and the hardest to do. Um, and I hope I did it right because I, in the end, I was afraid she was too hard. And the danger, anytime you gamble, right, it can go either way. Um, the danger is that I um, maybe went too far the other way to try to mm -hmm. find that space between them. But it's always a, a process. Yes. Right. Okay, I we are coming up on our time, but I want to ask you one last question. Also, we started a minute or two late, so I'm gonna gonna take this as I do for the full hour. But um, let's see. Manuela asked, "I love seeing the setting of your novels in places I recognize. So, how much of your work? And we kind of danced around this, but so much of your work, it seems, is influenced by these places you've lived and the place you're living now, which is the Eastern Shore, I suppose. So." How, how does that show up for you in your writing? Is it something you're conscious of or is it something you try to include or does it come up naturally for you? I don't think about it a whole lot, 
But I grew mm -hmm. up in one of the most beautiful places in the world, which is, um, you know, in, in a rural part of South Carolina, right, not far from the Little Petey River. And I have um, these images of that gorgeous river and those trees and the shadows and the, the woods there um, are, are, I just feel infused with that. The smell of tobacco curing is like just in me. No matter what I'm writing, it's, it's sort of in there. The second most beautiful place that I've ever lived is the Eastern Shore of Virginia. And I, those have been the two landscapes that have really been, I've used the most. I don't always use them in an overt way. Sometimes they can be a critical part of the story. If my character is at odds with the landscape, then it can become a part of the conflict. If the character is just mm -hmm. operating in this world, then it's just, it's more of a backdrop. But even if it's just a backdrop, I need for it to be a real and believable kind of a place. Um, I don't use place names because I do not want people going and looking for the barber shop on the corner of Strawberry Street, right? Because I'm not that little I, I put things where I need them to be and I don't want to get into issues like how the zoning board would never let us renovate a hotel and live in it in Cape Charles so I stay away from that but I use those places very very frequently I feel like the places are in me and if I don't have a reason to use another place I probably will kind of default to those I was telling somebody the other day I was on a panel and we were talking about place and I said you know I could go I could set a book in Rome and I could use the landscape of Rome and would enjoy doing that but it would probably still be a character um, from the south who's in Rome right like that would still mm -hmm. be a part of it because it's it, it, it would just be infused so yeah right it's that grounding on it yeah yeah yep. well thank you so so much for your time thank you everyone for being here